I've been able to make a lot of mistakes in a very short period of time. And it's important to me for this business to go really fast. And what I learned in the beginning is that if I just try to make it go fast, it's going to stop. And for me to get it to go fast, I really have to slow down. And through thinking about where I really need to focus time and what is working and what's not working, it's helped me to slow the business down. One of the hardest parts for me in learning uh, how to do this job as CEO, I mean, I remember nights where I've Googled, like, what does a CEO do? And I think any CEO who says they haven't done that, it's probably lying to you. So it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's that, it's that late night at your desk when everyone's gone and you kind of go, gosh, I want to check this out. And one of the, the hardest parts for me in, in learning through this job is if, if so much of what I'm doing is about talent and hiring, then it means that when I'm bad at this job, there are going to be people who have the right core values and who want to be successful, but through my own professional development and through me learning how to do this job, they're not going to be able to succeed. And that to me is unbearably painful. So the primary reason I want to be as good at this as I can and really try and shorten that fuse is because I know that my learning curve is going to be littered with talent that couldn't come to fruition. So the better off I can be in this leadership role, the more of those people are going to be able to make a positive impact in our business. And it really gets me excited. Hey everyone, I'm Palmer Higgins and welcome to the Big Time Small Business Podcast. I interview owners, operators, and founders of the small businesses you see every day but don't hear enough about. We talk about the obstacles they have faced, the successes they have earned, and where their business is going to inspire and inform you in your own career. On this episode, I speak with Peter Handy, CEO of Bristol Seafood, a seafood processing and distribution company. Originally a research analyst on Wall Street, Peter bought Bristol four years ago and spent the first two learning the business under the previous owner before taking over as CEO in 2016. Since then, Peter has focused on adding talent to the organization and putting in processes that will allow the company to go fast. Peter is on a mission to make seafood America's favorite protein, and he shares what the past four years have been like as a 32-year-old CEO of a small seafood company in Maine with large ambitions. Peter Handy, President and CEO of Bristol Seafood. Thanks a lot for being on the Big Time Small Business Podcast. Thanks a lot for having me. So really excited about this because uh, um, you are a, a different owner operator than um, a lot of the people I've had on the podcast thus far in that your tenure with Bristol is relatively new. Uh, you bought the company in 2014, right. um, but the company's been around since 1992. Exactly. So let's first talk about what got you in to decide to buy a small business? I really wanted to live in Maine. And uh, the reason why is because my wife grew up vacationing in Maine. So I was living in New York City before working in a traditional finance role. And as we would come up here on the occasional weekend to take time off, we fell in love with it. And we looked at each other and said, you know, one day when we retire, we'll definitely make a move up to Maine. And what happened is after we decided to have our first child, we said, you know, when we retire, we'll move to New York. We really want to live right now is in Maine. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to replicate the career I had in New York in Maine, but ultimately realized that, you know, through that reflection, I wanted to get back to doing a small business the way I had done. I started one in college. It was a lot of fun. And um, so we looked at a bunch of different businesses we could buy from everything from IT consulting and oil change companies and oil delivery companies. We looked at a steel mill and when we looked at seafood. It really changed my outlook on the ability to impact a space. Uh, the average person in America eats very little seafood. There are a number of reasons why, which I'm sure we'll talk about as we go. 
And uh, going beyond that, the impact of getting people to eat more seafood is big for human health, for the environment. And so we thought it'd be meaningful work. We see an opportunity to really create a brand that sits within Maine and gets people to eat more fish. And so we made the decision to take the plunge and acquire the company in 2014. And here we are. Yeah. So finance background in New York, and then you decide to leave that and buy a small, small business. Man, that sounds crazy. <laughs> yeah. Also <laughs> sounds familiar, yeah. by the way. <laughs> um, so was that scary? I'm, I guarantee that I know some of your friends from New York had to have been calling you crazy because my friends from New York called me crazy when I did the same thing. The Slightly sc- different avenue, but the similar mantra. The, anytime you're about to do something scary, because you're right, it is scary, is it's even scarier when all the people you're with can't relate to it. So you, you, know, you go talk to your friends and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing. And when they look at you cross-eyed and you're still thinking about doing it, um, it, it just compounds the fear because it's something that was so personally important to me to do that not all the people I spent time with could understand or relate to. And there are a ton of people that would have loved to have the job that I had in New York. So to leave something that other people want to do something where there aren't a lot of people attracted to it in a, in a place where, you know, more people are moving to New York than are moving to Maine, uh, so it was terrifying, but ultimately it was the right decision. Sure. So I, I quipped, you know, there's similarities between us. Obviously, y- you run Bristol, um, which is different than Chen Mark's model of, of sort of having separate CEOs for our portfolio companies. Uh, but that said, you know, very similar in, in looking for and acquiring a small business. It's not sort of a well-trodden path for sure. And certainly the way you did it uh, is even less well trodden because you bought the company, but then didn't take over the the, the reins, didn't take over a CEO for almost two years. Yeah. So talk about that decision of of being in a in more of a business development role for two years before taking over the helm. Well, I've I've never run a company the size of Bristol before, and there was an acknowledgement of that when I came on board that it doesn't make sense for me to immediately come in and be CEO because that's not where I can add the most value right now. So I wanted to have a seat where I'd really understand what the business was doing and where I could fit in. And I had the benefit. I spent all of 2013 doing due diligence on the business. And my background is as a research analyst. So you can imagine the amount of modeling and documentation and third-party research we built up on this, you know, what would be relative to the amount of research, a pretty small acquisition. And I thought that I could have the most impact on the sales side. I got to meet customers, got to understand purchasing, figure out how production flows through. And at the end of the day, we're a company built on customer experience. So understanding that experience put me in a good position to be able to lead the company as a whole. So something that I get asked a lot that I think is going to be uh, worthwhile for you to, um, what expectations did you have going in that proved to be false? And what surprises, what surprised you the day after closing or the, the months after closing that you didn't expect? The, so right after we closed, the company's first quarter in 2014 was its best financial quarter it ever had, which was the kiss of death, right? Kiss you, of death. You never want <laughs> to put up your best quarter after you just got there. So it's great. It makes to, you look like a genius. Though. It makes you look smart, but you're getting credit for, you, we hadn't done anything, right? So we just showed up, print this great quarter, we're at the board meeting, you know, God, how hard is it selling fish? This is pretty straightforward. And one of the things we learned, is that the biggest thing that that hit me is the company only the, the bulk of its sales were across two product lines, which is haddock and scallops. And haddock and scallops are consumed very low by Americans. So the idea was, well, if we can get the same market share we have on those items with, say, salmon and shrimp, which are consumed at 20 or 40 times the volume, like, my goodness, the, the company will go platinum. How hard can this be? And I didn't fully appreciate how much specialization comes into play with some of these species. So just replicating your market share from one product to another, which seems adjacent, isn't always as adjacent as you think. Why is that? Because part of it's built on the ability to procure the product. So for example, for salmon, there are huge salmon farms that are owned by large multinationals where we simply couldn't add the value that those salmon companies were already bringing. And logistically, it didn't make sense to bring it to Maine. So the the playbook 
that made us successful with scallops and haddock, even though it was seafood, that playbook wasn't applicable to those other adjacent product lines. Okay. So that was an assumption that proved out to be false. How about any surprise? Biggest surprise is there are many more people saying they're willing to pay premium for quality than there are people who actually are willing to pay a premium for quality. It, it turns out that almost every buyer you talk to says, oh, absolutely. If there were a much better scallop, I'd pay 50 cents more a pound all day long. But then only you know one or two out of those 10 end up having that behavior. And the reason why is it's hard to go all the way through a supply chain and sell that quality all the way through to the end user who then is willing to make that purchase decision. And that was a big surprise for me. Sure. So I think now a good time to take a step back for those that don't know who Bristol Seafood is and what you guys are all about. Let's hear sort of the uh, the quick pitch of of what you guys are, who you guys are. Yeah. So at Bristol, our mission is to make seafood America's favorite protein. And the reason that's our mission is because it's got some really important comp- components to it. The first thing is, for example, if you go from the bottom decile, to the top decile of eating seafood, your risk of fatal heart attack falls over 90 percent. If you look at uh, climate change, for example, the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions in this country is industrial agriculture. Seafood doesn't have those features. And being from California, you know, something that's close to my heart is water conservation. And you've read about the droughts and how focused folks are on fresh water out there. And if you look at, for example, a pound of fresh pork to bring that to market takes 3,500 gallons of fresh water. So, you know, over 25,000 pounds of water to make a pound of fresh pork and seafood has a very different footprint. So for those reasons, we think the work is really meaningful. And the, the way we're trying to get people to eat more fish is, so, so to give you some context with American seafood consumption, the average American eats 15 pounds of seafood. That compares to 220 pounds of overall animal protein consumption. So there's a lot of room, even going from 15 to 16 pounds is a dramatic change for the industry. And the way that we're working on doing that is we stick to three core beliefs. The the first thing is we always tell the truth. A a third of all the seafood sold in the U.S. is sold fraudulently, meaning I say it's salmon and it's actually tuna. It's usually not the species, of course. It's other things that are easier to substitute. But those are, it's a real issue that's come to play in a variety of different ways in the press recently. One third. One third. <clears throat> and who in the supply chain knows that? Everyone? Is it dirty little secret to everyone in this in the supply chain that understands that? It's it's the thing the thing happens that you would expect to happen where everyone in the supply chain says it's not me, it's the other guy. So uh you have a lot of finger pointing, you have uh a lot of people that associate it with ignorance and not intent, but it's uh difficult when study after study after study comes out saying that when seafood is tested at point of sale, high-value species are substituted with low-value species and mislabeled, it's hard to imagine that it isn't a systemic issue. Brutal. Okay, so that's, that's number one. So the first thing is we don't commit any fraud. and <laughs> That's a good core value. It's actually a big deal. When we hire people in, we're able to attract great talent from people who've been at seafood companies that do operate in a gray area, in the, but they're passionate about seafood, we can be a kind of an oasis for them because they can come do what they love and what they're passionate about in a way that matches their values. Uh, the second thing is we make the highest quality product we can. So we don't start with a cost in mind. We start with the quality in mind, and then we figure out how to get to that quality in the most efficient way possible. And a lot of other companies are focused on how to make seafood just good enough you won't spit it out, whereas we're really investing to have something that when somebody eats our scallop or has a bite of our haddock, they go, this is what it's supposed to taste like. I had no idea. And what I point people to is we get that experience when we even give it to some chefs. I have a voicemail on my cell phone from a chef who is the buyer for now a casino group who's been buying scallops since 1995. And he called and left a voicemail. I have my cell phone number on all of our packages that get sold into wholesale. And he called and said it was the best scallop he'd ever had in his life. And I played it for the team. And that's what we play for. And uh, the the work we do is really hard because it's not just 
a series of decisions that get us to that place, but it's a hundred little things that make it so when that scallop leaves and gets all the way to that chef, he has that experience each and every time, but it's really meaningful work. And then the last thing is we share the story behind our products. So seafood is one of the only things at the supermarket that a lot of times somebody woke up in the morning, put their boots on, went out and hunted down and killed and dragged back for you to eat. There's really no other story like that in produce or in beef or in chicken. It's the last hunted thing that as Americans we eat. And that brings with it an amazing amount of storytelling where we can connect people to the food they're eating and connect people to the people who are helping them to procure that food. And so our, our belief overall is that if we tell the truth, we make the highest quality product we can, and we bring everyone into the story behind that product, that we have a chance to drive American seafood consumption. Excellent. Uh, what very well said for, uh, for you, do you, who do you, who is your customer? I think that, that sounds like an obvious question. It might be an obvious answer, um, but it might not be. So from your perspective, who is your customer? So we sell to companies that sell to restaurants. Exclusively. We also sell to supermarkets. Okay. So those are really the two big customer groups. So ultimately, seafood, the seafood market in the U.S., 70% of it is eaten outside the home, meaning food service, meaning restaurant. And the other 30% is sold in retail, meaning you're eating it around your kitchen table. So our customers are primarily just wholesale distributors that then go and sell the restaurants, or we sell directly to some supermarkets that then offer our product to consumers in their stores. Got it. So when you're talking about quality and you're thinking about quality, and I have to imagine you have your ultimate end customer in mind. So while your customer might be a distributor, you're probably thinking about, you know, John Smith, who's heading down to the grocery store to pick up Haddock for dinner that night, or, you know, the the couple going out to celebrate their anniversary at the restaurant, their favorite restaurant to have some seafood. Um, when you think about quality, what does that mean to you and your team? What it means to us is an eating experience that is jarringly positive for the person who's having it for the first time. And in, in such a way that it changes the way they think about that protein. Um, the hardest part is that because almost all of our products are wild harvested, there's a lot of volatility and variability. And we know that having high quality isn't enough. We have to be able to provide that on a consistent basis. So for us, when we're talking about quality, what we really mean is consistent, high quality. And that that's what we try to achieve. Sure. Um, so I want to talk, you're four years in to Bristol Seafood. Um, what, what was sort of the, I imagine the first couple of years was getting your feet underneath you. Or the first year was getting your feet underneath you. But after you took control of the company in the CEO role, mm -hmm. uh, in 2016, sort of, did you have a roadmap of what you wanted to do, what you wanted to bring to Bristol? Yeah. So we really think of it in a three phase plan, right? Our first phase is tuning up the business. So we came into a business that was family owned and we wanted to make sure that we had good processes in place. And that tune up was the first step. And how long did that take? Uh, it's still going on, right? It's one of those things that is iterative. And each time you think you've taken a big step forward, you by very virtue of that, uncover more opportunities. So it's uh, a bit like, I don't know who said the quote, but the smarter I get, the less I know. Yep. It's a little bit like that with, you know, whether it's lean manufacturing or process development, because as soon as you get over one whole hurdle, you see two more. So what I can say is our business is much more efficient now than it was before, meaning that we're putting out more and better product with less input cost. But it's something that's going to be ongoing. But we got it to a point where we knew we were operationally healthy. And from there, we want to scale that business. So now that we've got this thing that's more tuned up, now let's not do anything new, but let's just do more of what we're already doing well. Because it's hard to do new stuff, and it's risky to do new stuff. And a lot of people don't think about that when you launch a new product, it's just like launching a new business. And it turns out most new businesses fail. So if you have a business that's working and you've tuned it up some, why not do more of that? So that's what we've worked on this year, and you've started to see – us talking more about that, what that tune up with, what that scale up looks like and scaling up for us is hiring more salespeople. 
So we've hired more and better salespeople, more and better sales leadership, and we're seeing dividends in that in terms of customer growth. Um, now the third phase of this that we're looking at is doing something new, right? Whether it's a bolt on acquisition, whether it's a new product launch. And we're, we're cheating a little bit because we're playing in between scale up and doing something new with some of the new projects we're doing. So for example, we're already in the Scala business. We're already doing Haddock and Cod, but what we're looking at is new consumer packaging technologies, which will be able to take that product that we're working so hard to make such high consistent quality and be able to get that in front of a consumer and the way they see it in the store and before they even taste it, they go, wow, that is different. And that's something that I want to buy and bring home. So in some ways it's brand new, but it's built on the shoulders of what we already know we're doing well in an area where we're successful. So you have a lot of different avenues, right? So you have more of what you're doing. Uh, and I want to talk about that in terms of how you think about growth, um, and sort of the, the strain it can put on an organization. Um, you talk about bolt on acquisitions, a very financial thing to, th- to, to contemplate. It's rare to see small businesses engage in, in M and a, um, but given your background and how you got into Bristol, I'm not surprised. Uh, and you're talking about essentially doing that in house, launching your own product line. So how do you, is it a, do a little bit of all three and hedge your bets? Or is it a timing thing of you want to be do, focusing on one versus the other two? How do you, how do you sort of allocate your mind share and your team's bandwidth across those three growth drivers? The thing that, really guides the decisions that our whole leadership team makes is growing in a way that's consistent with our core values and growing in a way that is complementary to the existing business. Not just synergy like, well, you don't need two HR people and you don't need two CFOs, but truly synergistic as to where a customer would have their experience meaningfully improved by virtue of us acquiring a company or bringing a product in-house. So as we think about where we're going to grow, one of the hardest parts with doing an acquisition, for example, is our core values and the way we go to work is relatively unique. And it's not something that I'm willing to sacrifice. So for us, we haven't been able to find a company where all the stars have aligned in terms of, yes, it's adjacent. Yes, it's complementary. The valuation's right. And everyone there has the kind of core values that we want. So let's bring the thing on. And because we haven't found that, it hasn't been an avenue that we've been willing to entertain. So what we're doing in a sense is hiring in in that way, which in some ways is like an acquisition. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're looking at product development ideas that we can bring through, you know, obviously they have more risk to them because they're not an up and operating business. So when we go out and, you you know, for, for plant expansion and for new product development, you only have to pay book value. The issue though, is that you have a higher risk because you don't know if it'll work or not. You have all that execution risk added in, but right now that's where we're spending more of our time is we're hiring on to scale the business we've got most aggressively we're adding in some new capability, I'd say, kind of at medium speed. And we're mindful of the fact that there will be opportunities for acquisition down the road, but today we're not actively pursuing any. So I would, I would agree with you on the, uh, the bolt-on acquisitions, uh, having looked at my fair share for all of our portfolio companies. Um, I, would, I am staunching the category that it's a very rare thing for all those stars to align. And I think the biggest thing that certainly if I put my – my research analyst hat back on and you throw it into a spreadsheet like, man, well, think about, you know, smaller companies trade at smaller valuations. And, you know, this is amazing. Like it's, it's so creative, but what gets lost in that is this, is this funny intangible thing called culture yep. uh, that is so critically important yeah. um, and really jacks up your ability to execute well. And there's almost no price. I mean, I could get, I could, I could do some tech on acquisitions for $0 and it would be a waste of money. Yeah. Um, and that's tough because deals on a spreadsheet, they can look really good. You can make those numbers sing um, and they are sexy. Uh, and for a lot of team members, that can be very alluring of, great, we can get this step change growth. We don't have to go through the process of going, you know, first base to second base to third base. We can just go, do not pass go and go right to home. Uh, do you deal with that internally with your team or are they sort of more bought in to the, let's let's build it ourselves? My team understands that, 
we want to be successful. We want to grow. We want to be a winning company. But they also understand that we want to do it in a highly specific way. And because of that, we've all been on the same page. I, if, frankly, I, I wouldn't know how to explain to the team, yeah, they don't fit quite right culturally, but gosh, have you seen what's going on with our top line and our bottom line growth? I just, I don't know how to communicate that in a way that uh, is authentic. And um, for us, it, it went, when that opportunity eventually comes along, we're, we're going to be in this for a while and eventually we'll find something that is that right thing. Sure. Uh, but the team for now understands that this is the right pace for us. Got it. So you are you are doing a lot, um, and and talk about expanding organically. You uh, you guys recently announced a five million dollar expansion, plus hiring forty uh, new positions. So that's a net increase of fifty percent. That's right. That's some that's some serious growth. So I want to talk about growth management, change management, organizational change management. Um, sort of what do you foresee that doing to the company, and how as the CEO, how are you prepping the company to be able to handle? I mean, that's just not incremental growth. That's that's step change growth. One of the things um, that I've been saying since I became CEO is that I wanted to see Bristol do incredible things. And what I didn't fully appreciate is that I think every CEO says that. And most companies don't make big bets. And so when we announced internally that, we were going to invest $5 million and add 40 jobs. People were a little shaken up. Um, is that a, is that a bet the company kind of bet? We wouldn't make a bet the company kind of bet okay. because we have so many families that work there. It's uh, That's a risk level that, frankly, is comfortable for me and was very comfortable for me in my prior jobs. But with this one, we're really a steward of uh, a larger company and, and a brand and, and the jobs that all of our team members have. It's not a risk level that we find appropriate. But, um, you know, people were excited to hear about the change, but I still don't think, truly believe that it was going to happen. And then just today, we had one of our biggest pieces of equipment show up in the plant. And people looked at it coming through the door and it was almost like, wow, this really is happening. And on Saturday of this week, they're going to cut a giant hole in the side of our building and a crane is going to put a new freezer tunnel in the side of it. And again, I know people are going to look at it and go, wow, I know Peter said this thing was coming, but it's really neat to see it actually coming. And one of the things that uh, us taking this kind of step with as a business is we are only going to be as good as the team that we have. So we can add as much good equipment as we want. We can make all the investments we want, but ultimately the people inside this organization need to rise to the occasion and be a part of that. And what this has shown the team is that not just are we willing to take a step forward with resourcing the business, but we know that this team can step up and take that on and bring it to the next level. So as much as it's a vote and confidence in the sector and the industry and our customers and our values, it's an equally big investment in the people we've got. And they know that. They're excited to be a part of it. And uh, for us, the main thing is making sure we have the processes in place, the training in place, so that way we, we know this is going to be uncomfortable with this level of growth. We know it's going to be, create friction and issues, but we need to have it happen in a way that is tolerable and ultimately gets us to a better place. Sure. So uh, and one thing that, that I keep thinking about is, as you're talking is... Uh, the, the corollaries with the conversations that we're having with our own portfolio companies and talking about building the foundation and making sure the team's ready to execute and really making sure it is a, it is a team decision because anything that's coming down to a mandate, whether it be from a CEO or in our position as, a, as an owner of our portfolio companies, if, if we mandate something, we're going to own it and we can't own it. We can't own it across six companies. And even as a CEO in a company, you can't own everything. Um, and that's, that's obvious to say, but, and then I, I compare it to both of our roles previously in New York as, as analysts and, you know, your entire job is spent on earnings calls and in spreadsheets and in, and in reports. Um, how much has that interpersonal side, um, evolved for you as being a business owner, um, versus just the nitty gritty of, you know, Hey, I, I know that, you know, I know this contribution margin is going to be positive for my business, or I know that, you know, this ROI is going to be a great investment and I structure it this way. 
Uh, can you sort of talk about sort of both sides of that? There's a guy named Frank Martino who has a quote that says, ideas are easy, but execution is everything. Totally agree. And I can have all the ideas I want. It can look as good as it looks on a spreadsheet. And the fact is that's not unique. Anybody can can do that. Being able to put an organization in a position to be able to execute on those ideas and not just kind of slog through one expansion and hope that it gets done well, but build the skill set so we're not a company that can do an expansion and survive it, but we have a crack operations team that does expansions. Not just that we can hire a salesperson and onboard them well and they can sell stuff, but we have an organization that knows how to build and bring on and develop and grow salespeople. And that shift of, okay, this is a thing we're about to do to this is a competency we're developing and growing is a big one. And that was something that I didn't fully appreciate when I first became CEO of the company. And that shift in focus has really changed how I spend my time, uh, the people that I end up hiring and the way that I talk about what we're doing as a business. Awesome. So let's dive into that then. So how has that evolved over time? How has your job evolved and how has the people you've hired evolved? I am much more focused on hiring now than I've ever been. And uh, you you can never have too much talent. Um, the difference between somebody who's the right person in the right seat at a job and who truly gets it is so profoundly different from somebody who's mediocre at it. And so we've spent a lot of time identifying, training, and empowering people to be very talented in the seats that we have them in. And you almost don't realize what you don't have until you hire the right thing. And then it's, you, you wonder how you ever did it before. Sure. Uh, and how, how do you know it's the right person? Because it could be the right person in the wrong role, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's the classic Jim Collins, get the right people in the right seats on the bus. Yeah. So how do you know if it's A, the right person or B, that they're in the right role? It's, a team, it's something my team and I spend a lot of time going through. So everyone in our company gets assessed. We, we decide if they're the right person by if they share our core values. We have six core values and we look at whether they exhibit behaviors that demonstrate they understand those core values. And we have a guilty until proven innocent culture where just because you don't show something in contrast to those values isn't a reason that you're a good fit. You have to actually behave in a way that affirms you understand those core values and that you live them. Okay. So quick aside, what are the six core values? Our six core values are honesty, humility, being curious and adaptive, having an owner mentality, getting stuff done right, and uh, making fact-based decisions. Okay. So you only hire people that have your core values. Right. You empower them. Right. Uh, there was another, there's a third part. I cut you off in the middle. Well, the, the second part, we're talking about right person, right seat, right? Sure. So right person is core values fit mm -hmm. and right seat for every job in our company. A lot of people put together, um, these big, long job descriptions that always end, you know, with and other duties as assigned, which isn't very helpful for people. So we, we've adopted something called, uh, Gino Wickman wrote a book, a book called Traction, which is on the entrepreneurial operating system. That's something we implemented at Bristol last year. So this is, he, he writes about the idea of right people and right seats. He's not the first to write about it, but that's the system that we use. And for right seat, what we do instead of having these giant flowery job descriptions, every person in the company has three to seven core functions. And what we look at is whether they first, for each of those functions, whether they get it, whether they want it, whether they have the capacity to do it. And what we say is that someone isn't the right person if they have our core values and they're in the right seat if they GWC get, want, and have the capacity to do each of their core functions. So when we put those two things together, it really helps with talent assessment. And one of the things that surprised me is I think there were times before we looked at it this way that unfortunately we had people who were the right people but in the wrong seat that ultimately failed in our business. And what we're doing now is there have been plenty of examples I can give over the last year where we've had the right person who's in the wrong seat. We put them in the right spot and they do great. And it's also made it simpler for the team to understand that if someone doesn't have our core values, but they're really good at what we do, we still don't want them. And while that's a hard thing to do, it's an easy decision to make. And that's been really powerful for the company and getting our culture to the right place. 
And so how much of this, how much of this have you learned yourself? How much of it did you know going in? I mean, what you're talking about is, is not stuff that's taught as a research analyst, right? right. Um, and, and it's probably not something. Or an undergrad business programs for oh, that matter. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so how have you been able to figure this out in what I would call relatively short order? You're talking about a level of, of thoughtfulness and sophistication um, that, is, that is unique and commendable uh, in, and, and done in a very short amount of time. So how has that come to be? Obviously, it's been by intent. Well, um, I've been able to make a lot of mistakes in a very short period of time. And it's important to me for this business to go really fast. And what I learned in the beginning is that if I just try to make it go fast, it's going to stop. And for me to get it to go fast, I really have to slow down. And through thinking about where I really need to focus time and what is working and what's not working, it's helped me to slow the business down. One of the hardest parts for me in learning uh, how to do this job as CEO, I mean, I remember nights where I've Googled, like, what does a CEO do? And I think any CEO who says they haven't done that is probably lying to you. We Googled how to buy a business before <laughs> we started Chenmark four years ago. So it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's that, it's that late night at your desk when everyone's gone and you kind of go, gosh, I want to check this out. And one of the, the hardest parts for me in, in learning through this job is if, if so much of what I'm doing is about talent and hiring, then it means that when I'm bad at this job, there are going to be people who have the right core values and who want to be successful, but through my own professional development and through me learning how to do this job, they're not going to be able to succeed. And that to me is unbearably painful. So the primary reason I want to be as good at this as I can and really try and shorten that fuse is because I know that my learning curve is going to be littered with talent that couldn't come to fruition. So the better off I can be in this leadership role, the more of those people are going to be able to make a positive impact in our business. And it really gets me excited. So you say that um, moving fast is important to you. And mm -hmm. so it's clear that you have high ambition for Bristol, um, which is not necessarily good or bad. It is, but it is different. Uh, not every business owner uh, or CEO wants to go fast. So what is it about you or about Bristol or about the opportunity that drives you to want to go fast, which I assume means grow big? Yeah, it's the, the reason it's important to me to grow is because it's a signal that our mission of getting people to eat more fish is working. And because of how small our business is and how small our industry is as a whole, there's no way to accomplish the mission slowly. So really what we're looking at... Why, is, do, why do you say that? There's no way to accomplish the mission slowly. You said that going from 15 to 16 would be monumental. It, But it won't happen. My, my point is... That's if, pounds, pounds of fish consumed. Yeah, so if, if the pounds of fish consumed goes from 15 to 16 pounds... It's that extra pound isn't going to go to every company because it's going to go to the handful of companies that have been able to adapt in a way that the, that resonates with the U.S. consumer. So if you have one pound of fish, which is seven and a half percent growth ish, go to 10 percent of the companies in the space, you're talking about 75 percent growth. And I, I can't, I can't think of an industry where there has been, um, you know, widely fragmented pickup of growth. It's been a company or three or five or 10 that have really driven the growth that moved the entire space. And we want to be one of those companies. And so <clears throat> when you think about that growth uh, in, an, in an industry like yours, where the supply chain is fairly large, mm -hmm. and I would, I would argue fairly complex, how do you tackle growth when you are a, a sliver of the of the large supply chain needing to in, needing to influence those above you and those below you. We talk to our customers a lot, and we look at what's possible on the procurement side a lot. And our job is to really, once we understand what our customers are looking for, and we have an idea of what's possible in the area of the fish we can buy. We cross those trades and make sure that we have the production capacity and tools necessary to get it done. 
um, you're, you're right. The average piece of fish is touched by seven different legal entities before you eat it. It's a lot of people. It's staggering. Yeah. Especially when you think about the fact that some of it's fresh and how, how sure. is it that and, seven and people can have title? think about the geographic spread of a small business. I mean, uh, people are going to go to your website, but just to beat them to the punch, scallops are coming from Japan. Your cod is coming from Alaska. Your haddock's coming from Norway. Your mussels are the only things that are coming from Maine. Right. Um, but I mean, you're talking like that's every corner of the globe around Maine practically. Right. We're a little business that has multinational issues, right? We're buying in multiple currencies and our fish, when it, we bring it in frozen, we just bought three container loads of scallops from Japan. They'll be on the boat for six weeks and we have yen exposure and also the spot price exposure of the asset itself. So there is there is a large degree of complexity. Just take a step back. Spot price means what for the, those people? The actual the actual price of how much the scallop costs. So yeah. you've already bought the scallop. We own it, but we don't get to touch it for six a, weeks. You've locked into a price. <laughs> so if the price of that scallop changes before it gets to you, you have an unrealized gain or loss. Exactly. That would be the finance slash accounting way to talk about that. Exactly. And you know there there are times it doesn't happen often. But the difference with trading something that's liquid, I mean, you can imagine if you uh, buy a bunch of Apple stock and it's off and you want to sell it, you press a button and it's gone. Um, it's a little more complicated with frozen fish, particularly when it's on a, uh, you know, a marine vessel when it's on a shipping container halfway between Japan and Boston. It's, it's an illiquid asset that you can't sell. So the price risk and the market risk that we take on as we build inventories to meet our customer needs is real. So when you're talking about, I'm going to, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning of this podcast and you looked at all kinds of different businesses. And so when you were doing your year's worth of diligence, and I'm sure you went deep on industry fundamentals uh, in seafood processing and distribution, Mm -hmm. what was it that got you over the hump of being like, you know what, as a small business, the thing I really want to do, they're risky enough as it is because they're small. I really want to layer on some currency risk. I want, to, I want to layer in some spot versus forward risk. I want to layer in some you know, cross-border issue risk, regulatory risk, food issues. Um, you know, what got you over that? We didn't pick the business that would be easiest to run. Certainly not. We picked the one that for the effort it will take, relative to the effort, it will give us the most impact. And we ended up, of all the things we looked at, I think this is the hardest business to run that we looked at. <laughs> but the the magnitude of the win, and I'm not talking in financial terms, but I'm talking in terms of brand development, uh, with the, getting people to eat more of this product, changing the way that people think about consumption, um, and financial on top of that as well. We think the win for this is magnificent. And when you look around in a retailer, there is no premium brand of fresh or frozen seafood. You can think of brands that exist for canned tuna. Mm-hmm. You can think of brands that exist for breaded things that are in the freezer. But when someone says, you know, I want the best tuna or the best scallop or the best salmon, Today, there isn't a brand that if you survey people, they'll all point to. And we think that there is an opportunity in the market to take up a small part of that space. And we think that the reward for doing so is big. Sure. So because it's a question that I guess that I get asked a lot, I got to ask it to you. Um, is there an end game for you in Bristol? So when people say You're that... finance guy, you bought a business. I get this question all the time. Yeah. What's the end game? Clearly, you already must be thinking about the exit if you bought a company. People ask that all the time. I know they do. And, you know, every time we bring in a consultant or every time we focus on growth or every time we have, you know, a project where we're trying to take cost out of an area, the question is, oh, my goodness, he must be looking to sell it. And the fact is we actually have no plan to sell it. And, you know, when you talk about an illiquid asset, a little seafood company in Portland, Maine, this is something that, frankly, uh, we've occasionally get calls with folks expressing interest but it's not something that we have any interest in selling. In terms of where we are as a company in our process, we're a 25-year-old company, but we're a little bit of a startup. And most of our competition has owners that 
are far older than I am. I'm 32 years old and I see a real opportunity that as those folks want to do something new, that we can be on the building and growing and buying into the transaction instead of on the selling end. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about being a 32 year old CEO, um, is that something that is scary? Is that something that you have to explain away when you have, when you take meetings with potential clients or new customers or employees? I, customers tend to like it because really? I think they understand that we're in it for the long term and that we're not trying to navigate a year or a quarter. I think that when folks get to know us, they know that we're really long term focused. And at the end of the day, that's going to result in value for them. It gives them some more confidence around pricing, around product development, R&D, all those sorts of things. For employees, you know, frankly, I don't think I get a chance to have an honest conversation about it. I can say whatever I want, but I don't know if I always hear back uh, what's real. But what I can tell you is it, it, um, I think of it as an awesome responsibility. And because of my age uh, versus the size of the opportunity uh, that we have here at Bristol, I give a lot of thought on how I can be great at it. Sure. <clears throat> so when you think about growth and you think about, uh, you, you keep coming back to this thing about impact and how that really is the driving the driving mechanism was, was what makes you want to go fast and get big. And so what are the sort of, what are some key milestones that you're going to be looking for to hit to let you know that you're on track? So it's one thing to say, I want to go fast, mm -hmm. but then how do you know if you're going fast enough or too fast? Uh, how, how do you sort of, what's the barometer with which you look at the business? Yeah. So I think the, there are some things on the positive end we can look at as our markers of success. And there are some things on the negative end we can look at to say, is it too fast? Um, on the positive end, what we're really spending time watching now is consumers or chefs asking for our product. So when we get um, retailers start to ask for our brand and start to give placement to entice us to bring our product into those stores, we haven't had that happen in a lot of places yet. But that's a real marker of success because it reflects consumer attitudes about our brand. When we have chefs call and they say, hey, I live in this area. I used to be a chef in this other region where I could buy the product. I can't get it over here. How do I do it? Those are the kinds of things that are markers of success when we get that pull from the street level. In terms of going too fast, the the marker for, for me is we want to go as quickly as is practical without creating so much turbulence along the way that we can't solve it. So if the number of problems we're creating through growth internally in terms of process issues and people issues, and oh, I thought the pallet went over here issues, if those things are uh, uh, taking place at a rate the leadership team and I can solve, we'll keep growing. Which brings the natural question of, you know, part of what limits our ability to grow is the strength and talent of our team. And is one of the reasons why it's so important to us to invest in talent, because if our ability to grow is a function of our ability to solve growing pains, which is then a function of the level of talent we have on the team and the, in the level of the processes that we have in place, then if we want to go fast, what we really need to do is to slow down and hire the right people and create the right processes while creating products that we know are going to resonate with our customers. Makes sense. So what does a day in the life of Peter Handy look like? Oh, day in the life. Well, it starts uh, early. And the reason it starts early is I have three daughters under five years old. And um, so I'd love to spend time active, with them. Active household. Active household. We're... Uh, while we're in the midst of renovating our plant for this new equipment, we're also renovating our house. Sure. So why not just do both at the same time? You know, it's, you get a package deal, right? Yeah. So a day in the life right now is a little bit complicated, but I tend to get to the plant pretty early so I can see startup. One of the things that I've learned over the last couple of years is that if the production lines start well, it's going to be a good day. And if they don't start well, it's going to be a bad day. There's almost no way to have a good start and have it go wrong. And what is a good start versus a bad start a for those that haven't spent time in a fish processing plant? A good start means you walk into the production line before everybody's there and everything's in the right spot. So 
for our filet room, for example, the you know cutting boards are on their spot, the stools where folks stand up to get to their areas are set to the right level. The box of knives is prepped and by the door so people can get things out of it. Things as simple as there's paper towels by the hand washing sink. So that way, ever after everyone washes their hands, they can dry off and put their gloves on. You can imagine if we forget to put our gloves by the entrance to the fillet line, we can have 25 people show up to start that shift and start the line 20 minutes late. And when you start the line 20 minutes late, not only are you less efficient, but you're missing customer things and all sorts of things like that. So the first thing I look for is like what you'll hear about folks talking about in, in a kitchen as chefs, you know, your mise en place, right? Is everything in its place and ready to rock? The first thing I look at is whether all of our production lines are prepped and ready to go. And then I look at how our team shows up and goes into their spot you know, having everyone be on time and engaged and present is huge. And then when those machines start running and things start getting going, did we, are all the machines prepped? Is everything up and running? Are the knives sharp? And when you see the product flow through well and it goes in the box, goes on the pallet and everything's in its spot, the behaviors that were required to have the line start in that elegant way are the same behaviors that are required to have it run well and end well that day. So if I got to only see a 15-minute snapshot, it'd be the five minutes before folks showed up on the line and the 10 minutes after. And I think I could tell you about 80% of how the day was going to go. Wow. Okay. So we've, we've got you through the morning then. You got me through the morning. Yeah. Uh, I spent time with our customer service team, which is based in Portland, Maine. So I'm on the customer desk with them, listening to customer order flow, taking a peek at inventories. We have our business development managers, which are out in the field, which focus on our new business acquisition. And I'm typically uh, writing notes. So they'll give me requests at the end of each day. Hey, can you write a letter to this prospect we're working on or send a sweater to this existing customer to thank them for helping us open this account? So I go through that work. Um, and then I spend some time catching up with my leadership team. And from there, I, I try to spend more time watching than doing. Uh, we work with a great consultant who's helped us on the food safety side. And she had a great quote. I almost fell over when she told me. She said, Peter, don't just do something. Stand there. <laughs> <laughs> and I like it to hear that. You know, when you think about what the New York job was like, it sounds like you had a similar one. I mean, I remember. You know, people putting up screensavers on their desks that were out in open areas that had screenshots of Excel sheets so no one would know they went home. So the appearance of doing something was so important. And for us now, for me now, I really try and spend more time observing and seeing uh, than actually, you know, being sitting at a computer or, you know, sitting in front of a notebook. Sure. So one thing you just said that I wanted to ask about uh, is sort of, really tactical question is the use of consultants. Mm -hmm. Uh, I talk to business owners a lot in my day job and there's a really, it's, it's almost like the topic of working with family. It's an incredibly binary response and it's never neutral. It's, they're amazing. I get to bring in this unbelievable hyper specific talent and basically get to download everything they know. And then they go on their way and we're the better for it to their, it's highway robbery. They come in, I pay them a bunch of money to tell them what I already know for them to tell me what I already know. And nothing really ends up changing. Well, you know, it's, it's the C word, but it's not a four letter word. <laughs> and, um, it's funny on a previous podcast, the C <laughs> word was corporate. Uh, oh. so now we have a lot of different C words here. There we go. There we go. So I, anything left unmanaged will go to hell. And I think, uh, if you hire a consultant and you don't have decent vendor management that you need with really any vendor you have, just like you need with a team or an individual employee, uh, to expect a positive outcome is unreasonable. So we bring people in that we vet in the same way that we vet new team members. We give clear, specific goals that we want them to accomplish. And we give, um, you know, metrics that we know whether they're on track or not. And we try not to ask open ended questions. And uh, when we do that, we tend to get positive results. We don't always get positive results, but we think that there's a higher likelihood that we will. So that little, uh, what you said before is sort of a, another way of saying, you know, what you can't measure, you can't manage. Um, but the, uh, the sort of the, the counterpoint to that is 
uh, if you overmanage things, you're stifling sort of this, uh, this uh, nascent creativity. So where do you, where do you shake out on that dynamic? Obviously it's not one extreme or the other, but. Well, so, some things are worth stifling. So okay, I, 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 I stifle that. our lawyer, right? <laughs> so I've, I learned very quickly the difference between emailing a lawyer an open-ended question and saying, here's a document. I have highlighted the one part that I want you to read and give me an opinion on, and I do not want you to read any other part of it. So in that situation, stifling is quite useful. In other situations, you know, when we work with uh, a design team to help us come up with a new consumer package, we're not bringing them in and saying, here's exactly what I want it to look like because we want, we're, we're paying them to give us the feedback on what it should look like. But I am making certain decisions, putting parameters around it. So that way I know it works for how we buy product, the species we want to focus on, the colors that are consistent with the rest of our brand. So I, I actually think structure um, is a way to enable creativity. Um, it just needs to be done appropriately and in the right place and not adding structure where you're not adding value through doing so. Fair. Um, so I want to pretend that we fast forward 10 years and you're on the big time, small business podcast as the first returning guest. I oh, can't wait. What will you be looking at to say, yeah, we, we, we were successful over that 10 years. I think the, the, one of the markers is going to be the types of products that we're selling. And I, I'd like to be in a place where it's meaning different kind of seafoods. I mean, seafood that's closer to the plate. So instead of selling, uh, for example, uh, filet that then needs to be cut up or seasoned or cooked and whatnot, being closer to the end user's application. So I see portioned, seasoned, prepared in some way. So like, for example, I talk, I love seafood. I want people to eat more seafood, but I'll admit it. Sometimes we don't always eat seafood at home. <laughs> and one of the, thing, one of the things that is, uh, so easy to cook and so versatile are those little vacuum packed pork loins with the marinade. Mm. Those things are so helpful in our house because you can cook it in 15 minutes. The leftovers keep great. I can put it in the kids lunch. I can make a sandwich with it and everybody loves it. And if we can get seafood to a place where, I mean, I, I can cook seafood in 15 minutes and I can have it work well as leftovers and put it in a sandwich, et cetera. But I want to empower more consumers to be able to interact with seafood in that way. So to me, our product lineup uh, will be closer to the plate than it is now. And as a result, I think more of our business will or we'll see bigger retail growth. We've seen very good food service growth. We'll see bigger retail growth. And I think we'll have a larger business. And so do you say that because... Um that getting closer to the end product is makes it easier for you to brand yourself with consumers or <clears throat> by doing that, you will be able to reach more plates uh, because the food, the protein, the seafood will be more accessible. So you'll, it's more likely that you're going to get from the 15 pounds to the 16 pounds. Well, if you, if you think about it, it's kind of how much of the job are we getting hired to do? Right. Um, when Bristol first started filleting fish, that was value added because you don't have to fillet it yourself anymore. I mean, think about the fisherman's providing the service of going out and catching the fish. Then it's getting filleted. The more of that job we can take on before it hits the dinner plate, as long as it stays consistent with our values and our brand promise, the more value we're going to add to the consumer. So I think that that does things where, you know, they're more likely to eat seafood if it's a more convenient, more delicious option than some of the other proteins available. It's going to build our brand because they're going to be able to rely on that consistent quality that they know has a clean ingredient statement and is nourishing for their family. And it's going to help us grow our business. Also has the added benefit of probably increasing margins is you add more value add means more margins. You put on the finance hat. As we do more work, we want to get paid more money. Fair enough. Okay. I want to uh, I want to wrap up the interview with a couple questions that I ask everyone. Uh, the first one, uh, and it sounds like to a degree you've you've done you've accomplished this recently. So uh, I'm interested to hear your answer. Imagine there was this magic pause button in life. Four months, 
nothing day to day regarding Bristol was going on. So you didn't have to you didn't have to see the the production line start up or break down. Um, you didn't have to check in with the the sales staff or your management team. Uh, but you had to allocate those four months furthering Bristol in some way. How would you allocate that time? Oh my goodness, it's a great idea. Uh, I'd spend more time talking to customers. I think taking a solid month or two to truly live in our customer shoes and be a supermarket buyer and be a counter person at a grocery store and selling fish and hearing what I would hear, being a street rep for a food service company and being a chef. If I could do a two-week internship and all of those, it'd be outstanding. Uh, And then honestly, in the last two months, I'd take a vacation, spend some time with my kids, and Everyone, come back a little bit fresher. Everyone says vacation. <laughs> I normally stipulate vacation. But I didn't. I didn't think you were going to go there, so I didn't cut it off. But all right, I'll, I'll just I'll lengthen your uh, your internships You'll and take away the vacation. Double them out. Yeah. Uh, okay. Next one, and to again to a large degree, you actually have already done this uh, with your five million dollar expansion. But I'm gonna ask it anyways. A uh, million dollars lands on your doorstep. You've now already gone through this expansion, so it can't be that. Uh, how do you allocate that million dollars? And that might not be big enough for a capital intensive business like yours. So we can jack that up to another 5 million bucks. Let's do 5 million. Why not? With with free money. So free money. I think with with $5 million, what I'd love to do is continue to build out our sales organization at a faster rate. One of the things we've learned is that salespeople don't pay for themselves until they're cumulatively until about 18 months through. So to be able to take a big bite of salespeople, you need to have a little bit of cash. Mm -hmm. So we could accelerate our hiring plan. And the other thing we'd love to do is to take some of the areas where um, we can tune up the business we've got. So upgrading equipment uh, that's going to help us to get our product done more efficiently. And those would be the two areas. Okay. Last one, most open-ended, also turning into my favorite. What haven't I asked that I should have? (laughs) The best interview question. Yeah. I think the, the biggest one I would ask is, you know, what, what makes us think that the premium segment in seafood is a place worth being? Okay. And I just had a meeting yesterday with a customer where I said they sell three different tiers of product, a low end, a middle, and a, a high end. And their low end is 75% of their business. Their middle is stagnant, about 15%. And 10% of their business is high end. The fastest growing is the high end, but it's the smallest base. The second fastest growing is the low end, and the middle is basically doing nothing. And... The, the reason why we're focused on premium is because we see that as the best way to convert people to want to be a part of seafood. And the reason we think that that's the segment that's worth pursuing and it's going to grow is just based on consumer behavior and the questions that consumers are asking about the food they're getting and where it's from and how it's produced. And we think it's the right place for the market to be. I would agree. Appreciate the time. Thanks a lot for being on the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Big Time Small Business Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review and share the show with a friend. To access show notes and subscribe to our distribution list, be sure to visit us at chenmarkcapital.com slash podcast. That's chenmark, C-H-E-N-M-A-R-K, capital.com slash podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at chenholdco, C-H-E-N holdco. Last but not least, we'd love to hear from you, so please drop us a line at podcast at chenmarkcapital.com. Thanks a lot.